this song, I want to wish my very dear friend Martha Crowell <clears throat> a very happy birthday. Today is her birthday. And the words to this song remind me of her, <clears throat> excuse me, because when, with all she's been through and all she's overcome, her faith in the Lord has not wavered. Trust in me. <clears throat> Let us bow for a word of prayer at this time. Lord, may the words that Margie just, just sang lift our hearts today. Lord, may we trust in you. When the waters are rough, may we trust in you. We know that we will face storms, but we do not face them alone. Instead, you journey alongside of us, the one who can calm the storm, the one who can lift us up above the storm. Lord, we pray that your spirit would lift us up at this time as we acknowledge your presence, which is already here, Lord. May we become more aware of your presence, of your, your hand upon our life. May we follow the leadership of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might make decisions for you, decisions that advance your kingdom, 
decisions that make us better representatives of your will, ambassadors of Christ. Lord, we pray for the lost in our community who face troubled times only looking into the darkness. May we be the ones who point them to the light. May they catch a glimmer in our own faith that it might lead to their faith. Lord, help us both in those times of, of faith as well as those moments of doubt and struggle as they are all part of our formation as you lead us to become who you are calling us to be, both individually and as a church. In Jesus' name we pray. For our, our kids, I wanted to start out by showing a little experiment here. I've got a large jar full of water, and I brought an egg. Do you like eggs? You might have eggs this morning for breakfast. All right, when I stick this egg in the water, do you think it's going to float or sink? Raise your hand if you think it'll sink. All right, raise your hand if you think it'll float. All right, only one way to find out. Oh, it went straight to the bottom. Look at that. Now, I wonder if we could teach this egg to float. Let's see if we're real nice to it and just tell it to float. Really float. <laughs> Mr. Egg, take a deep breath and see if you can float up to the top of the water. You think Mr. Egg could walk on water? Mr. Egg can't walk on water? I do know somebody that did. Our Bibles tell us that Jesus walked on water. It says that, that the disciples went out ahead of Jesus on a boat. He sent them on ahead of him. And then he caught up by walking on the water. And when he got there, Peter, he wanted to walk on the water too. But Peter was afraid that if he got in that water, he would sink just like this egg. But because Jesus was in the water, he believed that maybe, just maybe, he could do it too. Now I brought this salt to represent Jesus. So let's see what happens. Now it might make it cloudy. But I'm going to stir it up, and as it, as it clears up, you'll see what happens. Okay, let's stir that up a little bit. Don't worry, they had salt on sale this week. <laughs> We go swimming sometimes we go swimming in fresh water like in a swimming pool or in a lake but then there's other times when we swim in salt water where can you go to swim in salt water the beach that's right anybody been to the beach this year and yeah, we just went for a couple of days ourselves Anybody want to taste this water when I get done? It looks like I'm making Kool-Aid, doesn't it? All right, I think that should be enough. clears up you'll see what's happening when I just had the egg in the water it went straight to the bottom but when I added the salt and what do you see can you see the egg now as it starts to clear up where's the egg now it's floating up here at the top that's right 
that's a cool uh, science experiment. And there's a scientific explanation for this. As you add salt, it, it, it makes things float. It changes the properties of the water. But I like to think of that salt as being like Jesus. When, when Jesus entered that water, and Peter got into that water, not just with the water, but with Jesus by his side, it gave him the ability to walk on water too. It made him float in a way that he had never floated before. And it was only when Peter then moved away from Jesus and began to look towards the wind and took his eyes off of Jesus, that's when he began to sink. It shows us that when we face trouble in life, when we face storms, when we feel like, like the problems are overwhelming us to the point that we might might drown in our problems, that if we stay close to Jesus, Jesus can lift us up above those things so they don't pull us down. It also reminds me of something that Jesus told us. Jesus said, I want you to be like salt. There was a time when he said, I want you to be uh, like salt to the earth, salt to the world, that you might go out and add salt so it would make a difference. Because if we add salt to the lives of other people, if we introduce people to Jesus and, and put the salt of the Holy Spirit in their life by introducing them to the one that can lift them up, then it can make a big difference in their life. So that's two ways in this experiment reminds me of the power of Jesus in our life. That Jesus can lift us up when we are down. That Jesus can lift us up when we are sad, when we are angry, when we are frustrated, when we're all stressed out. Jesus can help us to rise above those things when we allow him into our life. And that we can help others to stay afloat by uh, introducing them to Jesus that he might be in their life as well. So let us think about this as we go to our Lord in prayer at this time. Lord God, it's a very simple thing to watch this egg float. We're just using things of your wonderful creation to help us to understand you better. Lord, we are amazed at the miracle of Jesus walking on water and the bravery of Peter to step outside of that boat and to try to walk with Jesus. Lord, sometimes we're scared to, to do the things you want us to do or to go to places you want us to go, Lord. May you take away our fear and, and replace it with trust as we trust in you, Lord. May you lift us up when we are down. May you, you pick us up when we fall. And Lord, most of all, as we have experienced the lifting power of your spirit, may we do the same for others. May we lift each other up, giving people words of encouragement, helping them when they need help, cheering them up when they, when they feel sad. Lord, may we be like that salt to the world that needs lifting up so bad. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our children may be dismissed now for Children's Church. Let us hear from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up, uh, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, he began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And the Lord bless the reading of this word. Do you remember watching those old Warner Brother cartoons when you were a kid? I used to like the Roadrunner. And Wiley e. Coyote always had a scheme to try to capture that, that Roadrunner. 
And sometimes it would cause him to run off the edge of a cliff. And he would just stand there in the middle of the air, not knowing what was going to happen next, not even realizing that he, did, he no longer had a solid footing. And he'd be staring over at the roadrunner. And the roadrunner would go beep, beep, and, and kind of wave at him. And then he would look down. And it wasn't until that moment when Wiley Coyote looked down and realized that he was off the edge of the cliff, that's when he began to fall. And right where he used to be would be a little cloud of, uh, of, of dust, and he would fall all the way to the bottom where he would land. You remember that? Well, I feel like Peter kind of had his Wiley Coyote moment in, in our scripture this morning. He went out on the water, and he was doing just fine. He was staring at Jesus the way Wiley would stare at the roadrunner. And it wasn't until that moment when he took his eyes off the prize, when he took his eyes off of Jesus, and he looked to the wind, and he looked at the water, and he began to question and doubt with his circumstances. And at that point, he began to sink. Peter entered that water with a mixture of both fear and doubt. Now, we think about Peter, you know, it took a lot of bravery to get out of that boat. Can you imagine seeing someone walking on the water and then thinking, oh, well, I want to try that too. We see a lot of amazing things. You, maybe you see somebody on TV bungee jumping and you think, wow, that looks awesome. But do you want to do it? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Or you see somebody jumping out of an airplane, trusting in that parachute to catch them. Would you want to try that? It takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there like that. So we think about how much courage Peter had, but, but his... His doubts were also there from the very beginning. Did you notice how Peter asked if he could come out on the water? He said, if it's really you. If it's really you, Jesus. If it's really you, then call out to me and I'll come out there and meet you. Now, where have we, have we heard language like that before? Actually, we heard it on the lips of, uh, of the devil out there in the wilderness when he would say things like, if you're really the Son of God, then do this or do that. If you're really the Son of God, then, then you know, jump from the pinnacle of the temple and see if the angels will catch you. Oftentimes we want to test God. And, and, and Jesus explained then, you, know, you are to test the Lord your God. You're, you're just supposed to have faith and trust. So in that moment where, G, where Peter looks like he's being so brave, he really is, is testing God. He's trying to test his faith. So he steps out into that water with this mixture of both faith and doubt. Is it really you? Is this really possible? But here's the good news. Jesus still reaches out to us in the midst of our faith and doubts. You know, Peter is one of the example disciples in the scripture. He's one of the most famous saints in the church. So much so that we tell jokes where Peter is the one at, at the pearly gates who decides who gets in and who, who, who doesn't, right? Because he's been given the keys to the kingdom. That's one way that that passage has been interpreted. Uh, where, where Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. Or is that rock Peter? Or is that rock the, the profession of faith that Peter made when he said, you are the Christ? See, there are moments when Peter gets it very right. You are the Christ, he says. But just a few verses later, when Peter tries to argue with Jesus about uh, his, uh, him explaining that he had to go die uh, on the cross... He argued with Jesus and said, oh, there's got to be another way. Then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So we see that, that Peter's journey is this roller coaster journey where sometimes he says things so right that, that Jesus can take that confession and build a church. Other times he says things so wrong that he's equated with the devil. We see that on, on, on Friday when Jesus is uh, arrested and is going to be crucified. We see that that, uh, that Peter is the one who, who denies Jesus, denies having anything to do with them, and watches the crucifixion from a distance. It wasn't until the events of Easter that Peter came back around, and it wasn't until Jesus would reinstate him later on the beach as they enjoyed some, some fish over a fire. Peter's journey is one of ups and downs. It's one of faith and doubts. So the good news is that if your journey has both a mixture of faith and doubts, then, that's, then God is not done with you. God does not criticize you for being on this journey, even if, if it, it leads you to some bumps in the roads, as long as you're still trying, as long as you're still walking. 
As Peter was walking towards Jesus, Jesus helped him get where he needed to be. And when Peter no longer could, could walk towards Jesus on his own, Jesus reached out and grabbed him by the hand and lifted him up to get him where he needed to be. And God will do the same thing to you. So bring God what you're wrestling with. Bring God your struggles. Bring God your doubts. God can deal with Jesus can deal with those moments and use them as an opportunity to strengthen your faith and to show you amazing things in your life. I heard a story about a Lutheran, a Lutheran pastor, a Methodist pastor, and a Baptist preacher. They all went out fishing together. And they were out there sitting in the boat, and all of a sudden the Lutheran said, Oh, wait, I forgot my, my lunch. I'll be right back. And he got out of the, the boat, and he started walking on the water and went back to the car and got his, his brown bag with his lunch in it. And then he walked on the water and got back in the fishing boat. Well, they kept fishing. Nobody said anything. Kept fishing. And... And all of a sudden, the, the Methodist preacher said, oh, I forgot my thermos. I'll be right back. So the Methodist preacher got out of the boat, and he begins walking on the water, goes all the way back to their car, gets his thermos, and then walks on the water and gets back in the boat. With this Baptist preacher sitting there, and he's like, I, I just can't believe my eyes. I can't believe what I'm seeing. And I don't want these guys to show me up. I want them to know that, that we Baptists, that we have just as much faith. So uh, it was starting to get late in the evening, and, and he, he said, uh, you know, I probably need to call and check in with my wife, but I forgot my phone. My cell phone's back in the car. I'll be right back. And he gets out of the boat, and he takes one step, and he falls right into that water, and, and, and it goes above his head immediately. He scrambles to swim, and he swims to shore, and he, he makes his phone call, and he swims back and gets back in the boat. He, he feels kind of ashamed of himself. When he gets back in the boat, the Methodist preacher looks at the Lutheran and says, Do you think we should tell him where the rocks are? <laughs> If you're going to walk on water, you have to know where to stand. And that's part of what we see in this story. Uh, Jesus, is, his diagnosis of why Peter sings, he says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? There's some clues as to where Peter was standing in this verse, but in order to see those clues, I've, I've got to give you a, a word in Greek. And this word is, is a, a compound word, you know, Distazo. Di so you've got die and you've got stazo. And we do have some English words that, that uh, come from, from these Greek words that will help us to understand what this word means. And, the, and first, let's think about words that start with di, that prefix, like divergence or diverge. If something diverges, it means that, uh, that there's a, a point where things split and things are going in two different directions. Divide, to take a, something and divide it is to take one thing and then to split it in at least two parts. If you have a dilemma, that means that you've got a problem. It means that you're faced with a choice. It means that you have two possible ways that you can go. You come to a fork in the road and you have a dilemma. You've got a decision to make. Will I go left or will I go right? In chemistry, you may have learned what the word dioxide means, like in carbon dioxide. CO2, there are two, uh, two molecules of, of oxygen in, uh, in carbon dioxide. So di means two then, right? Dialogue is a conversation between two different people. You have to have at least two people. If you only have one person, it's called a monologue. So two, you have to have at least two people to have dialogue. And then you've got this word stazo, where we get words like stasis and stand. So stazo means where you're standing. It means your, your state, your condition at that given moment. And so when you put these together, you see that it means trying to stand in two places at once. I remember when I was a kid, one time we were hiking some trails in Ohio. And we came to this one spot where you could stand and you could put one foot in Ohio and one foot in Pennsylvania. There was a white line that went right across the trail that divided the two states. That was the border. And I thought it was so cool as a kid that I could stand there and straddle that line and literally be in two places at once. I was in two states, two zip codes. Have you ever had an experience like that? You say it's neat to try to be in two places at once because typically you can't do that. We worship a God who can. We worship the triune God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. But uh, all of our attempts at trying to be two places at once uh, failed. I had to call in this week and do a meeting remotely. 
because I couldn't be two places at once. For those of you who have tried to, to maintain social distance, you know what it's like to, to, to want to be somewhere and not be able to. We've all tried to be two and three places at once. Well, that's what Peter was trying to do when he went out there on the water. The word here, uh, the Greek word that I gave you, that's a word that's translated as doubt. And there are several words in Greek that get translated in our English as doubt. This is not the word that's used, for example, when Thomas doubts. So this is a word that's uniquely uh, used for what was going on in Peter's life. This isn't just doubt. This is him trying to stand in two places. And we see that when we try to stand in two places at once, we don't have a very good foundation. And instead, we begin to sink. And that's exactly what happens here. Before I got glasses, I had trouble seeing road signs. And I remember one time I was taking an, uh, an exit. I was going to a rest stop. And they've got that sign that says, trucks this way and cars this way. But I was heading straight for that sign. And Jessica was getting very worried. She said, where are you, going? Where are you driving to? Where are you going? You're going to hit the sign. I said, I'm trying to get close enough to figure out which way to go. I had to see, do I need to go left or go right? You see, when we're trying to be in two places at once, that's what ends up happening. We end up doing neither well. We end up driving straight for disaster because we aren't making a solid decision on whether we're going to go left or whether we're going to go right. It's like we're in this mental tug of war. Jesus said it this way. He said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. When we are torn in two different directions, when our allegiance is torn, when our focus is torn, when we, when we are divided and, and, and being pulled in two different directions, it keeps us from being effective. It keeps us from being able to overcome those troubled wars, and instead we get tossed around and become victims to them. So we have to choose where we're going to stand. In Joshua 24, 15, the choice is given to us this way. Choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. There are so many people trying to get our attention in this world today. There are so many voices that we hear. Do we listen to, to what they tell us on TV? And even there, which voice on the TV? Do we listen to this channel? Do we listen to that channel? Do we listen to this party or that party? Do we listen to this doctor or this scientist or, or this commentator? Who do we listen to? We, we may feel pulled in different directions in, in our family. Uh, do we listen to this family member? Do we listen to that? Do we ever get triangled into other people's problems and we feel like we're forced to take sides? Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. To me, that says choose whose voice you will listen to above all the ch chatter and noise. Choose whose voice you will allow to define you. Are you going to live your life according to this person's standards, that person's standards, or are you going to live according to God's standards? But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It's about choosing God above all, all else. Choosing God above, above our pursuit for, uh, for money, our pursuit for power. We choose God first, and then everything else will fall into place as it should be. That's the foundation that Jesus was teaching Peter, Peter that day out there in the, that water. To stand on the solid rock because Christ is that solid rock. We are taught to stand firm. Only if we stand firm on God and God's word can we weather the storms. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 16 13. And when we have our foundation in God, when we stand on the rock, which is his son, Jesus Christ, it helps us to rise above the chaos. One thing you need to know about water in the ancient world is that water was oftentimes a metaphor for representing chaos. We see this all the way back to the beginning in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1, where it talks about how God's spirit was hovering over the water. To an ancient person hearing the poetic words of, of Genesis chapter 1, they would hear that there was chaos and that God was rising and was above, hovering above the chaos. He wasn't a part of the chaos. Instead, God was above the chaos and God then speaks order into that chaos. Let there be light. Let there be land. Let there be animals. 
Let there be order that takes this chaos and forms it into something useful, something that God then describes as good. So from the very beginning of our, uh, of our Bibles, we, we profess that we believe in a God who can speak order into chaos. We then see the chaotic waters threatening uh, God's people when, when they're fleeing from slavery in Egypt and they're at the edge of, uh, of the Red Sea. There's chaos uh, of an ensuing army. There's chaos uh, of the, the uncontrollable power of water in front of them. How can they rise above? Well, instead of rise above, something even more amazing happened. God parted those waters. He made a pathway for them to go through the chaos on dry ground so they could get to the other side. We see a similar miracle later on when, when after they're wandering in the desert, they would finally uh, cross the Jordan and enter into the promised land. We see the same thing in our own, our own testimony as we come to Christ by passing through the waters. The baptismal waters represent the chaos of this world and that if we have Christ in our life, that we can go into those waters and that we can come out of those waters. That, that we are defined by, by God's spirit that lives in, inside of us. That our sin gets washed away just as that, that water belongs to the chaos and destruction of this world. Our sin that, that destroys is, is removed and instead we're replaced with the peace of God's spirit. So coming through the waters of baptism reminds me of, of this passage. As I stated in our, our, our invocation prayer, we, we're going to have storms in life. We've just come through a storm uh, recently. We're thankful that we weren't impacted worse than we were by the recent, uh, recent hurricane and tropical storms. We might have lost power, but that was only a temporary inconvenience. God got us safely through that storm. God will get us safely through those storms in life when we place our trust in him. If you want to rise above the chaos, if you want to be defined by God's opinion of you, by God's word, rather than being tossed around by those waters and defined by the chaos, then each morning I want you to ask yourself these questions. And the first question I want you to ask yourself is, what do I need to let go of right now to be calm? Peter began to sink because he wasn't letting go of, of his fear and doubts. He wasn't letting go of that life that he had before Jesus entered his, his life. He wasn't ready to fully commit to following. He was still wavering. What do I need to let go of right now? To be calm. What's causing you anxiety? Is there something that needs to be removed from your life? Is there something that you need to step away from? Is there something that God is asking you to give up? Maybe it's a habit or a behavior. What is God calling you to let go of? I know a lot of people that, that are curious about, about coming to church and they're curious about coming to Christ, but, but they're engaging in some activities that they don't want to let go of. They're scared that if they if they let go of these things, then they'll be letting go of a part of themselves. But instead, it's about letting go that you might discover. That it's only when you release and let go that, that you free up your hands for Jesus to reach down and grab you and pull you where you need to be. Scripture says, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? We cling to our stress. We cling to our worries. We claim to despise those things that cause us worry but we're so unwilling to let it go. We stay up all night thinking about these things, rehearsing these problems, where if we would just turn them over to God. It might be that we need to sit down with a pen and paper and write out these worries that we're holding on to, these, maybe it's some past mistakes or, or failures that you're allowing to, to, to damper your future. Write those things down and give them to the Lord and say, Lord, take these things away from me. I don't want to be defined by these things anymore. I want to be defined by you because who can add to their life by worry? But if all we do is embrace those things that bring us down, then they'll end up uh, getting the best of us. Don't embrace the waves that try to, uh, to, to drown you and, and crash upon you. Instead, look to that hand that's reaching out to pull you up. Ask yourself, what do I have to be grateful for? That's one of the greatest ways to rise above the chaos is to think about the positive. Instead of focusing on on the wind that threatens to knock you down, like Peter did in that moment, if he'd have kept his eyes on Jesus who was lifting him up, he would have risen above the chaos. So what do I have to be grateful for? Let me think about those things. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart and be thankful. Do you see how peace and thankfulness go hand in hand? 
It's only through the practice of thanksgiving that you can experience that peace that surpasses all understanding. And that passage in Philippians chapter 4, Paul tells us to pray with thanksgiving. So that theme of thanksgiving comes up over and over in scripture as a pathway to personal peace. You have to ask yourself, what am I trying to control that I really don't have control over? Peter had no control over the wind. Peter had no control over the waves or how deep the water was. He only had control on his own decisions. When he placed his faith in God and went where God was calling him to be, when he listened to the voice of Jesus who said, come, and he stepped out on faith, that's when he was able to do things that he didn't think were possible. Because he wasn't trying to change the storm. He was trying to navigate the storm by following the one who had already made the footsteps that he needed and already led the, you know, the, the way for where he needed to go. What am I trying to control that I really don't have control over? Am I trying to change other people? We don't have the power to do that. Am I trying to change circumstances that are much bigger than me? We can't change, we can't change these things that, that, are, that are beyond our reach, but we can, we can change whether or not we allow these things to get to us. I can't change how that other person acts, but I can choose whether or not I allow their actions to get me upset or to cause me to act a certain way. That's when we're really giving ourselves over to that other person. But instead, we, if, if we let it go and we turn and listen to Jesus' voice, let go of those things that we cannot change and turn to the one who, who's in control, then who will find our, our hand in the proper place, and that's in the hand of our Savior who's lifting us up. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you in my righteous right hand, Isaiah 41.10. Finally, in order to navigate the storm, in order to, to know where to stand, well, you've got to locate the rocks in the water. And that rock is Jesus Christ. This scripture gives us direction there. It says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rocks. You see, that, that wise person that built his house on the rocks doesn't have to, to fear the storm that's coming and the water that's heading their way. How do we do that? It says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. So twofold there. One is that we have to know what the words of our Lord are, and we do that by studying Scripture. We do that by reading our Sunday school books, by coming to church and hearing the word preached, by engaging with conversations, either in person or online, and, and learning as much as we can about, about, about God's word and God's expectation for us. But it's not enough just to, to read those words or even listen to those, those words. If, if you have a, a, an audio book or if you're listening to a pastor tell you what the Bible says, we have to then go and put these things into practice because that's how you internalize. You know, education comes not just by hearing what a teacher says, but then going and doing those things. You can hear a math teacher stand up and tell you all day long, this is how you do math. But it's only when you put the pen to the paper and start to do those equations yourself. And it's only when you try and fail and try again and improve over time, that's when you internalize that information. I began by saying that Peter's journey is one of ups and downs. Sometimes he got it right, sometimes he got it wrong. That's okay. He was a student of the master. That's what it means to be a disciple, is to be a student. He was a student of what Jesus was teaching him. And it was by listening and then going and trying it. Listening, stepping out on faith, walking as far as he could, even if it meant sinking where he, he fell short. We have to be willing to, to put God's word into practice and see what happens in our life. And when you, you do, you will not be disappointed and do amazing things. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rocks, on a good foundation. I'd like to conclude with an Old Testament passage that really sounds like a, a, a good, good way to illustrate all the, the theological points that I see here in, in this scripture. And that's from Psalm 77, verses 16 through 20. Let us may, meditate on these passages as we hear them proclaimed so long ago in such a way that sound like they were paving the way for Jesus and what he did. 
here for Peter and for us. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. They were deep. Uh, they were very deep. Uh, they, they were afraid. The very deep trembled. This reminds me of how when they saw Jesus walking on the water, they became terrified. They weren't scared of the storm. They were scared because they were looking at the face of God on that water. Jesus said, here I am. It is I. Which reminds us of, of the name of the Lord. Jesus said, uh, uh, ego a me is the, is the Greek phrase. It is I. Which is like when, when Moses asked what God's name was and God says, I am who I am. The I am was on that water. And, they, and that, that water trembled, and the people witnessing that moment, they trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies thundered. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea. Your path through the mighty waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So long ago, God led his people through the water, through the chaos, to dry ground and safety on the other side. And God can do the same thing for us today if we we'll place our faith and trust in him. There may be times when you feel like you're out there on the water all by yourself. You may feel completely isolated, but know that Jesus is is right there walking towards you. The whole time when you feel like maybe God has abandoned you, Jesus is walking towards you. And if we just step out on faith and make that move towards him, we'll find ourselves in the arms of our Savior. Let us think about these things as we move our Lord in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for loving us and leading us, for, for helping us in those moments when the problems of life seem overwhelming, they feel like waves crashing down on us. Help us to rise above the chaos, the uncertainty, the doubts and fear, Lord, that we might place our faith and trust in you. Lord, for those who have never made the decision to follow you in their life, Lord, may, may they be inspired to do so during these times. Lord, may we, may we separate ourselves from the chaos that tries to bring us down and instead listen to that still small voice that tells us that we are your children. May we hear you calling out to us, identifying what is good in our life because we are your creation. May we seek to be in your hands that you might mold us and shape us into your image. That we might be, be on solid ground. That we might have a foundation on which we can stand and grow and reach for the utmost. Lord, may this church be a place that is anchored in you so that when people come to this church, they can experience the power of your presence in their life and be transformed as well. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for always being there with, with us and for us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our invitation hymn is The Solid Rock, and as we sing this song, if you've never made the decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then come forward and be baptized in this church. If you're already a baptized believer and would like to transfer your membership, then come forward and we would receive you with open arms. Let us stand as we sing The Solid Rock.
Let us pray. Lord God, may you indeed be the firm foundation on which our life is built. May we set the example for our family and friends and bring them up on solid ground as well. That we might rise above the chaos. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.